This video is going to cover lecture notes 13, which will show an application of probability in computer science, namely hashing, and we'll see how probability enriches our understanding of, of the concept of hashing. But before we do that, let's do a review of the probability we've done so far. So this is a slide that I took from CS188 because it pretty much encapsulates most of what we did in the previous lecture. So let's just go over each of these things to get a refresher. So the first equation is the equation for conditional probability, which is just saying that the probability of x given y is the probability of both x and y divided by the probability of y. And this is just a definition. So the next piece is the product rule, which says the probability of x and y is the probability of x given y multiplied by the probability of y. And this is a consequence of algebra on the previous uh, equation of conditional probability. And now the chain rule is just a generalization of the product rule, which is saying that the probability of x1, x2, x3, and, and xn uh, is the probability of x1 uh, multiplied by the probability of x2 given x1 multiplied by the probability of x3 given x1 and x2 all the way to uh, xn. And this is, this is all stuff we covered in the previous lecture. And then the last thing is saying that it's also a definition, which is just saying that the probability of x and y is equal to the probability of x and a probability multiplied by the probability of y if and only if x and y are independent. So let's get back to the topic that is going to be the subject of this, this video, which is hashing. So a quick review of what hashing is. Basically, we're going to take a, some universe, let's call it u, with uh, a bunch of elements in it. And u is typically a, a pretty large universe. It has a lot of things that are being hashed. So what we call the elements of this universe are keys. And what we're going to do is we're going to map all of the elements in these keys to some smaller set, T, which is our table. And it's typically going to be a lot smaller than U. And what our hashing function does is it maps elements in U to elements in T. And you see you're going to get some crossover. You're going to get multiple elements being mapped to the same thing. But what you'll get eventually is something that looks like this, where all the elements in U are hashed to some element in T. Now the actual function which decides what the keys get mapped to is known as the hashing function, h of x. And when multiple keys get mapped to the same element in t, they get instantiated as a linked list. So here we have that scenario. So you're going to get a linked list of length 3, a linked list of length 2, basically to encode that multiple elements uh, in u were, were hashed to the same value t. So we're going to need to be able to perform three different operations on this hash table. One is to add a key. The second is to delete a key. And the last one is to test membership for a key, which is just to check if a given key is in the hash table. Now we're going to want our hashing function to be good and ensure that too many keys don't get mapped to the same element in the table because that'll increase the lookup time uh, in order to add a key, delete a key, or membership test for a key because of the fact that the elements are t in t are stored as linked lists if multiple keys are mapped to them. So what we're going to do now is assume that our hashing function, h of x, distributes the elements in u evenly over 
T. That is to say that it is a good hashing function. Now, we're not going to go into detail as to what a good hashing function is and how you come up with one. Uh, there's a more thorough treatment of that in courses like 170 as well as 174. But here we're just going to assume that our hashing function distributes you evenly over t. Now this is where the probability part comes in. We know that we don't want this hash table to have very many collisions between keys. That is to say they get mapped to the same thing. So what if I ask the question, if t has size n, how many keys m can we store before the probability of a collision between multiple keys is greater than or equal to 1 over 2. So basically what's being asked is, what's the maximum number of keys that we can store in this table of size n and ensure that it still meets our specification, which is that our probability of collision is less than 1 over 2. Now, it is incredibly easy to think of this problem of hashing uh, in the same way we can think about balls and bins. So suppose we had m balls, which correspond to our keys that need to be hashed, and we had n bins which correspond to what they could be hashed to. Uh, now, we know that our hashing function h of x evenly distributes the uh, m over n. So that's why this, this works as well, because we have an even chance of making it into any given bin when we are tossing balls. So a, a way of restating the question that we've been asked is uh, let's define a couple of events. Let's say. A is the event where no two balls or more land in the same bin. Okay, so we want to know when is the probability of A less than 1 over 2. This is the same question that's been asked over here, just restated, to say when is the probability that no two balls collide less than 1 over 2. So we know how we're going to approach this. Basically, this is asking, uh, we can turn this into a counting problem by saying this is the number of ways to put m balls in n bins without replacement. And the reason it's without replacement is you can think of it as every time a ball lands in a bin, that bin is no longer an option for any of the balls to, to land in, so it gets taken away. So the number of different ways to um, put m balls in n, bin, in n bins without replacement is going to be uh, the total number of uh, of the outcome we want, A. And in the denominator, we're going to get the number of total possible outcomes of throwing these n balls. And we know that with every ball thrown, it has n possible uh, bins that it can land in. So by the first rule of counting, we know that this is going to be n to the power m total possibilities for how the balls can land. So. Uh, Let's calculate what the numerator will actually come out to. And basically, we're going to get that P of A is equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. Because again, on each and every throw, you've ruled out uh, one of the bins that, that 
that this ball being tossed can land in. So then eventually, if you throw n balls, you're going to get n minus m plus 2 times. For the last ball, there will be n minus m plus 1 bins that it can land in. And then on the bottom, we're still going to get n to the power m. So here we have it. We got an expression for what the probability of uh, no balls landing in the same bin are. That's a. So let's simplify this a little bit. Uh, this is the same thing as if we distribute the n across each of these terms, uh, by the way, which there are m of. So that's good. Uh, we're going to get n over n times n over n minus 1 times dot. Oops, oops. That's not what we're going to get. We're going to get times n minus 1 over n times end up with n minus m plus 2 over n times n minus m plus 1 over n. And this is, this is how we broke up all of these mn's into each of these individual terms. Now we can simplify this further and say this is uh, 1 minus 1 over n times 1 minus 2 over n times uh, 1 minus m minus 2, because minus minus is a plus here, over n times 1 minus m minus 1 over n. So there we have it. We have a simpler expression for the probability that no balls land in the same bin. So let's get back to the actual uh, question we were asked, which was, what is the largest m such that probability of a is less than 1 over 2? So what's the largest m after which point after which uh, the probability that no long, no two balls land in the same bin is less than 1 over 2. So the way we solve it is we plug in m equals 1 then 2 then 3 and so on and so forth uh, until we see that p of a is less than 1 over 2. But what if we don't want to do this? What if we want a closed form expression, an inequality that we can evaluate to decide when the probability that no two balls land in the same bin is less than 1 over 2. So the way we can do that is to approximate. Now before we do that, let's kind of recap what we've done so far. We found that the probability of A where A is that no two balls out of M land in the same bin when tossed to N bins. So the close, the expression that we came up with for that was 1 minus 1 over n times 1 minus 2 over n times 1 all the way to 1 minus m minus 1 over n. So this is the expression we came up with to express this probability. Now let's try to see how we can approximate this. What we're first going to do is to turn all these multiplications into pluses. We're going to take the natural log of both sides. So we're going to say the natural log of p of a is equal to the natural log of 1 minus 1 over n plus, now, natural log of 1 minus 2 over n plus all the way to 1 minus m minus 1 over n. OK, so now this is in slightly nicer form. What we're going to do now is we're going to use a certain approximation 
a fact to make our lives a little bit easier. And we're going to use the fact that the natural log of 1 minus x uh, is equal to approximately negative x for small x. So uh, the reason we can use this approximation uh, comes from the Taylor series of the natural log of 1 minus x, which is x minus x squared over 2 minus x cubed over 3 minus etc. So if we approximate it using negative x, sorry this was a negative x, we're basically just taking the first term of the Taylor series approximation so our error becomes all the remaining terms uh, and you can Im imagine that if x is small let's say x is 1 over n or 2 over n etc where n is a fairly large number that's just offhand uh, an example that may or may not relate to this problem so if x is relatively small these terms are going to become less and re less relevant very very quickly so I hope that um, showed to you that this approximation is not unreasonable. So now, uh, by using that approximation, we can rewrite this as the natural log of the probability of A is equal to negative 1 over N minus 2 over N um, minus 3 over N minus all the way to m minus 1 over n. So basically on this side what we have is minus 1 over n times the sum from 1 to m minus 1 of i which uh, you should know to be equal to m times m minus 1 over 2 uh, this is very easily derivable by looking at uh, what, it, what the sum looks like, 1 plus 2 all the way to m minus 2 plus m minus 1. You can group terms, and you'll see that uh, if this groups with this, this groups with this, you end up, uh, if you think about it, you'll end up getting this result. So this is equal to m minus m times, minus 1 over n times m minus m, m times m minus 1 over 2 which we're going to approximate this further as to be about equal to negative m squared over 2n. So now we've actually got uh, pretty close to the type of closed form expression that we want to be looking for. So we can say that we want to know when uh, the probability of a, we, again, we want p of a such that it is less than 1 over 2. So raising e to the power of both of these sides uh, and substituting for p of a, we get that e to the power minus m squared over 2n is less than 1 over 2. And through a little algebraic manipulation, you get that m has to be less than the square root of 2ln2 times n, which is approximately equal to 1.177 times the square root of n. So the upshot of all this is that given a hash table of size n, we can hash approximately 1.177 times the square root of n keys into the table before the likelihood of two keys getting hashed to the same number becomes greater than 50%. So let's see how accurate this actually came out to be because we made a few assumptions in computing this. So this right here uh, is a table from the notes which says uh, where n is the size of the hash table, uh, 1.177 times the square root of n is the value that we came up with. And the exact m naught is, it tells you exactly how many keys that you can put into the hash table before the probability, so before the probability of 
um, multiple keys hashing to the same number becomes uh, greater than 50%. So here we can say that if you uh, put one more key in a table of size n, your probability of two keys hashing to the same thing is now greater than 50%. So as you can see, these values track each other pretty closely, especially, especially at higher um, in higher orders of magnitude, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, there's pretty much no difference. So we've actually come up with a fairly good approximation. So now I want to reconsider a problem that we've already looked at, which is the birthday paradox, in terms of the approximation that we just came up with. So the birthday paradox can be, uh, if you don't remember, is where n people are in a room, and we want to know what's the probability that two people have the same birthday. Same birthday. So already you should be able to see that if we consider the bins in this problem to be the 365 calendar days, 365 days, we're basically asking the same question that we asked before. Or at least we can ask the same question as we asked before, which is that at, w at what number of n people uh, does the probability of two people having the same birthday become greater than 50%? And if you remember, uh, the answer was n equals 23 people is what caused that. And let's look back over here uh, where n is 365, that's this row here. Basically, we've just turned the question into uh, if you have 365 elements in a hash table, at what number of elements m does the probability of two elements being hashed to the same bucket to the same uh, value gr equal to greater than 50%? So we see here that the exact m0, the last value before it becomes more than 50%. So if you add 1 to that, we, you know we're going to get the same value as before, which is n equals 23, which is the point at which the probability that two people have the same birthday is greater than 50%.